Well, good morning to all of you, um, Branch family, anybody else who is joining us here uh, for a recorded Sunday school lesson. Um, happy Sunday to you. Very excited to be here with you this morning and uh, to dive back into our exploration of Middle Earth together. Um, just a quick reminder for anyone who's logging on and is like, wait, this isn't the branch room. This is really weird. Um, we changed up the format for our Sunday school series, um, the religious Sunday school, that we're, uh, we're trying something a little different. So we have our pre-recorded lesson here on YouTube, which you are definitely welcome to watch um, and to hang out and to reflect with me. However, we also have an opportunity um, for you to come and engage uh, engage with us um, in person. Uh, we are here meeting in the branch room at the same time this video is going live. And uh, we also have a Zoom link open where you can join us and you can be in the room even if you're not actually in the room. Um, so it's just a chance for us to catch up. And uh, last week we, we talked and we had a time of prayer for each other and we didn't spend as much time. I don't even think we spent any time last week talking about our lesson specifically, but it, it was good to um, to check in with our community and to be able to pray for each other and build each other up in that way. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to um, to come and check that out uh, if you're so interested. And otherwise, uh, I'd like to say a short prayer for us this morning, and then we will dive into our discussion of Middle Earth. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning, and God, I'm thankful for the creative ways that we are continuing to find to engage with each other um, and to continue to be present in each other's lives. Lord, I pray that the, our study this morning will enliven us, that it will fill us with something new and something wonderful. And may this be not just something to seek after this morning, Lord, but a calling on who we are to be as well. I pray that you are with our service this morning. Um, may you bless all parts of it, and may it all be glorifying to your name. Lord, we love you. We lift this time up to you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So as we've been talking about our journey through Middle Earth, and we've been, you know, reimagining some of the things that we, we see going on inside of the, uh, inside of the Lord of the Rings story, and we say, okay, how is this helping me to imagine my own faith journey? How am I how is what I'm seeing on the screen or how is what I'm reading in the book actually helping me to imagine doing things in my own life? And I hope that you, I know I say this every week, but I hope that you're finding this informative and instructive and that it's helpful in forming you to be a person of faith. Um, I've definitely enjoyed these little moments and getting to just meditate on them a little bit more. And we have Recently, we've been taking a look at some of these bigger themes, themes that seem to stretch throughout um, the movies, that stretch throughout the books, and they, they've been really personified by a specific scene, um, and we're going to do the same thing today where we're going to look at a big theme that is personified by a specific theme, but I, I think out of all the themes that we've looked at, this one is probably one of the most in-your-face themes um, that The Lord of the Rings has, and it is really this theme of companionship and really this theme of you know having a good friend to be there with you and I mean this should make sense to us the first movie is called the fellowship of the ring right and fellowship is not a term that we are unfamiliar with like we we understand fellowship we talk about Christian fellowship all the time um and so this is something that we're definitely familiar with and something that we know but I I want us to sit on this idea of friendship and really to think about it not just as, you know, a, oh yeah, I have my good friends, or oh, yeah, I even have my, my close confidant, but I really want this to be a morning of imagination for us, where we're able to really think and say, you know, if friendship is something that is not just a present theme in Middle Earth, but if it's also something that is biblically and scripturally a theme, maybe this is something that I can spend my time dwelling on and imagining and it's something that would be good for me to put time into, um, which again, I don't think is a big, huge revelation, but hopefully this will get your imaginative juices flowing um, about friendship. So 
I, I want to play this scene for you, um, which I think very greatly personifies friendship for us in Middle Earth. Um, just to help put the scene back in its context, this is right at the end. I think it's one of the very last scenes, actually, of the Fellowship of the Ring movie. And the Fellowship is being attacked by orcs, and Boromir has just tried to take the ring from Frodo, and Gandalf has just died, and Frodo's in this really dark place where he's like, I'm I'm leaving. Like, I'm, I'm bailing on everybody. And so the scene that we're going to watch, it opens on Frodo, and he's standing on the edge of a really large river, and there's a boat right next to him, and he is just about to launch off and basically leave his traveling companions behind. So let's go ahead and let's watch this scene together. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. I made a promise, Mr. Frodo. A promise. Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee. And I don't mean to. I don't mean to. Oh, Sam. With that scene, one of the greatest friendships. Sorry. But with that scene, one of the uh, one of the great friendships in uh, in fantasy, um, especially in Lord of the Rings, was born. But I 
I want us to to really think on this moment and to think about just the the huge impact that it has on the entire story and again what this might have to say for our own lives because I we we looked at it a few weeks um several weeks ago now but the the call that Frodo got and even this sort of like call that Sam was ended up receiving where he kind of just got tagged on to the end it it really manifest itself in a really big way here the the way that these two stories are intertwined with each other and so putting ourselves in frodo's position let's think about this gandalf the the mentor the the one who had initially called him to go on this journey is gone he fell into a dark pit protecting the entire company from this big mighty shadow demon and frodo's one of frodo's protectors boromir he could no longer be trusted. He was consumed with lust for the One Ring. All of the hobbits were frightened. Merry and Pippin and Samwise, they're all yearning for the safety and comforts of the Shire. And yet the greatest danger still lays ahead of them. And ultimately, Frodo had in his mind what he knew he had to do. He's probably been pondering it for a while now saying all right you know this this journey is definitely dangerous it's already taken out Gandalf and so using a time of confusion and a time of really attack by an enemy Frodo says you know okay I'm going to I'm going to put my distance between myself and the rest of the fellowship and from there these two stories are going to diverge even as they run along the same path and so as the company is frantically searching for Frodo and they're fighting off these arcs. We see the orcs, not arcs, um, but we see that Sam is probably searching for Frodo the most frantically of all. And you start to get a really good sense of Frodo and Sam's past, even just inside of this little scene where Frodo is getting ready to leave and Sam is just bursting through the forest trying to find him. And they'd already been on this journey together and they'd experienced so many different things. And if you read through the books at all, you get a little bit more of this than you do in the movie. But this wasn't the first time that Frodo had considered leaving Sam and the others behind. But in Sam's mind, this is something that just won't do. And this is something, it's a part of Sam's character that you see that just runs throughout all of the movies. Um, Sam simply will not allow Frodo to take such a treacherous journey alone. He wouldn't have allowed it earlier after making his promise. He won't allow it later as they're already on Mount Doom and they're so close and Sam is like, you know, I might not be able to carry the ring, but I'm just going to carry you. And Sam is determined to remain by Frodo's side. And so they go off, these two simple hobbit folk, they're floating downstream away from the safeties of numbers towards this ominous shadow. They're heading towards Mount Doom and regardless of dangers lay ahead of them, they're determined to face them together and this is no doubt a fact that brought great comfort and encouragement to both of them and it's this idea of friendship or this idea of camaraderie or even this idea of you know just having some kind of partner to do life with that i think is something that is so crucial to who we are as people right we we have these these cherished words that we use for people like father or friend or husband or wife or mother or son or daughter or brother or sister or partner or confidant or mentor. And these words, they, they carry with them the suggestion of support, of acceptance. They're a shoulder to cry on when you're sad or to celebrate with when you're happy. It's someone who remembers your birthday or cares about, you know, the little small intricate details of your work day. And it's, it's these people that really remind us that we were not meant to bear the burden and experience the joys of life's journey alone. And we see that this is something that is just consistent throughout the biblical story. The scriptures very often will talk about friends who stick really close together or two people who are you know just so intertwined together that it it makes life just so much more richer and fuller for the both of them 
uh, passages I want to read for you is from Ecclesiastes chapter four. Um, putting this passage in perspective, I think helps as well. Ecclesiastes is one of these wisdom books where the the author is um, he's really pessimistic about the world around him. He's really a not happy camper about things. In fact, one of the very first lines that you get in Ecclesiastes is vapor or worthlessness or dust. Everything is just, it's, it's like the wind passing. It's just the, the Hebrew word is hevel. It's just hevel. It's like a breath in the wind. It's just whatever. But this is also the same author who writes this passage. And here's what he says. He says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though they may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And it's this, it's this thread of friendship where there's two, but even pushing beyond two where there's three, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And you might have heard this before in a marriage ceremony, right? Where you have two people and two are strong together, but three, three is the number and you throw Jesus into the marriage there and you wind all these things together. And I don't know that that is what Ecclesiastes is pointing us towards, but I, I think that this, keeping this idea of two people are great together. Like one person is going to struggle a little bit. Having two people is great, but pushing beyond this idea to a cord of three strands is not easily broken. I, I think we start to see the bigger picture of God's intention for us. But let's take this idea of companionship and friendship and think about it in biblical terms, right? We go all the way back to the book of Genesis where God is creating things and God says, it's good and it's good and it's good and it's good. The only point where creation is ever considered not good in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2 is when the human is created and the human is alone. And God looks at the human and says, it's not good for the human to be alone. And so I will find a partner suitable for the human. And so taking the rib out of the human, God creates another one. And so the two humans sort of become the one and each one was a gift to the other one. Eve was the gift to Adam. She's an azer, a helper, something that only God is called in the Hebrew scriptures as well. And so Eve is meant to be something to Adam that only God could fill the place of. But it doesn't just stop with those two. We, we have the example of David and Jonathan. David is the chosen king of Israel by God who would sit upon the throne that actually legally would have belonged to Jonathan being Saul's son. But Jonathan seems to have this acceptance of David that transcends royal lineage. He, he gives him this loyalty. It says at one point that Jonathan loved David and he placed his own life on the line in defense of David. And so you know, we might even start to wonder, like, what would have happened to David had it not been for the companionship of Jonathan? We can think of somebody like Moses, who relied so heavily on his brother Aaron um, in the biblical story, where Aaron becomes the mouthpiece of Moses, even, and, you know, becomes this really close traveling companion, where in reality, I think we need to read the story as it's not just Moses freeing the people of Israel, but it's Moses and Aaron that are going out and that are doing this thing. And so these, these awesome leaders had, had all these different people. And even moving into the New Testament, I think you see the same thing, right? Like Paul had the steadfast traveling companion of Barnabas. And even when him and Barnabas fell out, you had people like Silas and like Timothy and maybe even somebody like Luke um, who was traveling with them. Or maybe we can think about one of one of the most powerful examples, I think, of companionship and of friendship is Jesus and the 12 disciples. And the 12 disciples are, you know, they become metaphorical language for followers in a bunch of different ways. But I, I think the, the model of companionship that the disciples have is something that's so special and something that's so unique. And one thing about this Lord of the Rings scene that we just watched that really stuck out to me is how similar it is to Peter's own situation as Christ is going to the cross, right? You've had the scene beforehand where 
Peter tells Christ, like, I won't leave you. I won't ever abandon you. It won't happen. And Christ looks at Peter and says, but the rooster is going to crow three times even before you. Um, or, yeah, before the sun rises, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. It's something like that. Um, and Peter's like, no, there's no way that's not going to happen. Um, you know, I'm never going to let you be crucified. And it's this, it's this big deep commitment to trying to be close to where Jesus is going that actually puts Peter in the situation where he has to deny Christ three times. He's so like, he's trying to be as close to him as he can. And he's sitting inside of the temple courts in order to not be removed from the temple court. So he could remain as close to Jesus as he could. He inevitably puts himself in the situation where he has to deny Jesus three times. But there's something, again, I think that's really beautiful about that and something that is very instructive and something that is very formative about that for us as we think about friends as we think about companions or even as we think about family and loved ones but the thing that I really want to push us beyond that too is you know having one friend and having some family members is is great but what does this tell us about our own community what does this tell us about the ways that we are meant to engage and interact with each other because I think that as we as we think about this and as you look at this idea of companionship through the lens of the New Testament, especially as the church is very first starting out, this was the idea that the church was saying, you know, we need to be looking at each other and treating each other like this in any and all circumstances. And so the church is not meant to just be a place where people would come and, you know, yeah, we worship together generally the same you know, with the same ideas, we generally believe the same things, but it's meant to be a place where you have people that you know love you and support you and are willing to run after you into a lake even when you know you can't swim. And I hope that the community that we are building here together constantly is a community that is like that, that is continuing to build each other up and support each other and continuing to help each other as we progress on the journey of life. But I want to just give, give you some final questions uh, to consider as, as we get ready to wrap things up here. And these questions pertain to this idea of companionship. But who have you been given? And maybe another way to look at this is to say, not even who have I been given, but whom have I been given to? Who am I being this kind of companion for as well? Who do you have who knows just what to say when you're ready to throw in the towel and what not to say when you need silence? Who is it that you call first with good news because you know that they'll share in your excitement? And whom are you that person for? Who are the ones that God has placed in your life to share the burdens and joys of your quest? And whom are you participating in the quest of? And again, this is a great picture to put on for our own life story, but what would it be like if we could imagine our entire branch family, our entire branch community engaging with each other in this way? What, what ways might we see our relationships differ, our interactions differ, not even just on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday evening, but maybe even differ throughout the week? I want to leave you with these thoughts to consider this morning, um, be thinking about these things, be praying about these things, and take this thought as an idea even as we move into, into the service together this morning at about 10, 15. Um, I encourage you to think about this because one of the things that we're talking about this morning in our sermon is going to be the idea of exile and what does it look like when you have everything completely and totally stripped away from you and what do you do and how does God speak to us through that? And I think this idea of companionship and this idea of community becomes something really important, especially in the midst of exile, because exile is saying it's not just me that is, you know, being the particular like target of God's wrath, but it's our entire community that seems to be experiencing something. And there's something really unique and there's something really formative about having companions and having a community that goes through that with you. So I encourage you to think on these things, to continue to talk and ask questions around these topics, and 
Again, I hope that you will join us for service here in just a few minutes. Um, for wherever you are, I hope that you have a good day and that you experience God's blessings. And again, hope to see you in service really soon.